There's one thing that we learn from history. It's the fact that we don't learn from history. Have you discovered that? We have read about and we've heard about all these people doing all these crazy things, yet so many of us end up doing the crazy things. So again, I'll say, there's one thing we learn from history. It's the fact that many of us don't really learn from it. That's why I'm so excited about the Bible because the Bible not only shows the strong points of, of characters, it also shows the weaknesses. The Bible tells us how to learn from history. In fact, as you read scripture, it says time and time again, learn from history. Learn from the history, God tells us, of scripture. Do you ever deal with any crazy people? I mean, our world is crazy, isn't it? Crazy people are everywhere. At the grocery store, on the athletic field, in school, around the office, the neighborhood, we're surrounded by crazy people. When I talk about crazy people, I'm not talking about people who are mentally ill. That's a whole other subject. I'm not talking about people who have a chemical imbalance. No, no, no. I'm talking about people who are whack, those who are loco, those who don't have all the line on their reel, those who are sort of wheels off. That's that's who I'm talking about. Really, I'm, I'm talking about what the Bible says regarding crazy people. And here's what scripture says, let me paraphrase. You go crazy when you say with your life, I'm sovereign, God, and you're not. I'm God, and God, you're not God. Whenever we make that decision, we are gonna go crazy. We take the crazy pill. There's another crazy, it's a good crazy. All of us are a little crazy. All of us have a cup of crazy in our family recipe, maybe some, a gallon or two, but good crazy is what we should be. And we're gonna discover over the next several sessions what it means to be good and crazy. But to give you a hint about what it means to be good and crazy, if I'm gonna be good and crazy, I'm crazy enough to make a faith decision. I'm crazy enough to humble myself before God. I'm crazy enough to learn from history and to say, you know what, God? You're sovereign and I'm not. And not only am I gonna say that, I'm gonna live that out. The moment we become followers of Christ, and many of you are believers, you've received forgiveness, you've, you've actually had a point in time where you've asked Jesus to, to dominate your life, to take control over your life, many of you are. I wanna draw a little bit of, of for you so you can understand where I'm, I'm going. If you're not a believer, you can listen in and, 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 and this will happen to you in a, in a more strategic way once you become a believer. But so often what I'm gonna draw for you is what they don't tell you before you become a Christian, okay? Here in the middle it would be you. You've heard me say this about the gospel, I'll say it again. The moment we become believers, the, the gospel starts off, it's all about you. But then quickly, once we make that decision, it becomes about others, you, you. The first concentric circle would be you. Your life, your needs, your desires, your plans. Jesus has come into your life and all of a sudden you see, wow, it's about other people. Because if you wanna grow deep, serve others. If you wanna get nourished and get fed, you become the nourishment in other people's lives. That's the story of the New Testament, you. Here's the second circle, the concentric circle, I say, of craziness. This second circle would be the crazy people in all of our lives. We've got them. Jesus had them read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus was always confronting and processing and dealing with crazy people. How do you do that? It's a pretty good question, isn't it? How do you confront the crazies, or do you? How do you cope with them? Do you just grin and bear it? Or do you just cut them from 
the herd of your life? Those are some, some great questions. We're gonna answer those questions over the next several sessions. You got you, I don't wanna go too fast now, and you got the crazy people. If you're a believer, because remember, the you in this circle is a believer, you've got the devil. That's right, the devil. And the devil does something. He's very strategic. The, the New Testament talks about the devil having schemes and plans. He puts a collection of crazy people in all of our lives. If we're not careful, these crazy people can stagnate and stymie our lives because the third circle is a circle that's huge. It would be the normal people, or you can call them the good, the GC, the good crazies. The normal people are the people that we should spend the lion's share of our lives with. There are the people who are receptive to us. There are the people who can speak truth into our lives. They are the people that we're here for. It's not that we should diss the crazy people. You know, we've got to confront them. But here's the, here's the, 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 the whole stress of the situation. How do you spend most of your time with the normal people, but you've got all these crazy people vying for your time? Because the devil is smart. He knows if he puts a collection of crazies around your life, he can mess you up for decades and you'll spend all your time talking to the crazy people on the phone. You'll spend all your time online. You'll spend all your time counseling them and encouraging them and trying to help them. You can even have Dr. Phil on retainer for them. But here's the bottom line. 20 years from now, most of them will be just as crazy, or I would say crazier than they are today. It's pretty convicting, isn't it? I'm talking to some people right now who are wasting their time with people who are crazy. What are you doing? And here's the crazy thing about this crazy pill message. The people who are crazy don't really realize their craziness because you're surrounded by crazy people. And the crazy people in your life are like, oh, that's a good decision. No, it's not, it's crazy. Oh man, that's, that, that's smart. No, it's not, it's crazy. So you could be crazy and don't even realize it because you got so many crazy people in your life. How do you confront the crazy people. How did Jesus confront the crazy people? He loved them, we should love them. He confronted them, we should confront them. He coped with them, yeah, we should cope with them, we gotta cope with them. He also, and we also need to cut some of them from our lives. I'm not talking about being mean-spirited, I'm not talking about being rude, crude, or doing things that are socially unacceptable. I am talking about, though, saying, you know what? Before God, I am gonna make the tough decisions and I am gonna spend the lion's share of my time with the normal, good, crazy people because I'm not gonna waste my time with the crazy people because they will Pac-Man your life and mine. So the moment you become a believer, are you ready for this? The devil strategically places the crazy people around us and so many believers never understand the fullness of walking with the Lord because they're hammered and just hounded by the crazy people. In last session, I gave you a list, I think, of 13 character qualities of crazy. And, and if you want to discover those, just pick up the DVD. Whenever I talk about crazy, though, and confronting crazies, I got to talk about Daniel. Daniel is an Old Testament character. You might have heard about Daniel, Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel's life shows us how to confront crazy people. We've got to learn from history. And we're going to see that Daniel talked to a very powerful 30-something-year-old guy. This guy received a history lesson because he hadn't learned from history. And because he didn't learn from history, he really messed up his life and the lives of many others. So if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter five, Daniel chapter five, and I'll begin reading with verse one. 
So here we go. Think back in, in, into history. I'm talking about 553 to 539 BC. We're, we're talking about learning how to confront the crazies in our lives. Daniel did this. Briefly about Daniel, the cliff notes. Daniel was deported from Jerusalem to Babylon when Babylon took over Jerusalem. Daniel stood out because he was a man of character, a man of purity, a man who sought the Lord. And because of that, he was able to speak truth into the lives of people. And he was even able to confront some crazy, crazy people. So we got 30 something year old King Belshazzar, who was throwing a giant party in Babylon. Babylon was a unique city. The, the city had walls that were 350 feet tall and 87 feet thick. And here's this young guy throwing this sensual party. Uh, verse one, Daniel chapter five, King Belshazzar, isn't that a great name? Gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. I mean, this was like the talk of the town. The only person who wasn't invited was Kanye West. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, and not only was he drunk, he was drunk with deception, intoxicated with his own self. He gave orders to bring, oh man, don't do this, brother, in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, don't you like that name, Nebuchadnezzar? I talked about him last time. The word Nebuchadnezzar, the name Nebuchadnezzar means tears and groans of judgment. Nebuchadnezzar, when he led Babylon to take over Jerusalem, took with him from God's house the gold and the silver goblets. Well, now the 30-something-year-old kid, Belshazzar, is taking the stuff stolen from God's house, and he is disrespecting God. Say disrespect with me. Disrespect. That's right. He was disrespecting God. You can't disrespect God. You can't play around like that. So it says his kings and his nobles, his wives, all of his people, and his concubines, wow, <laughs> might drink from them. See the last part of verse 2? All those people were drinking. They were just, they were just kind of daring God. The, the Bible said they were setting themselves up against God, disrespecting God. It, it's so fascinating. Our culture, we're all, we're all into respect these days, aren't we? And don't disrespect me. And we demand respect, respect, respect. I think we need to give respect. Instead of demanding it all the time, we need to give respect. This whole self-esteem thing has, has led to a bunch of self-worship. Back in Belshazzar's day, he was worshiping himself. He was like, you know what, I'm sovereign. He was worshiping this sovereign state called Belshazzar. And, and we have a whole generation of self-worshippers. We need to respect ourselves, not worship ourselves, and respect others. So this self a steam machine has just gone crazy. And it's all about me. It's all about what makes me feel good, what makes me look good, what gives me pleasure. The moment we begin to disrespect God, the moment we begin to put ourselves on the throne of our lives is the moment that destruction is going to be in the cards because the Bible tells you and me in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, that pride goes before destruction. So what goes before destruction? Pride, the right of pride. You won't see humility touted on the talk shows. Go to a bookstore, look in the self-help section. You're not going to see a bunch of books on humility because where humility is, God is. And where humility isn't, God isn't. So we have so much in common with this guy, so much in common with the Babylonians. I think it's also interesting to see how they took something that should have been in God's house and they worshiped it. 
They, they ripped it off from his house and they were worshiping what had been stolen from the house. In Malachi chapter three, the Bible says, you're robbing God. Then God says, you know what? You're stealing from me. And they're like, how are we stealing from you, God? And God said, you're stealing from me because of your tithes and offerings. You're, you're robbing me. Our blessings, if we're not careful, can become blockades to the house. In other words, we can stack up so much gold and silver and bronze and, and worship that, and we can say, oh yeah, God has blessed me, but these blessings are piled up so high we can't even see the house. We don't bring the resources to the house. We don't bring ourselves and our abilities to the house. Because see, as I'm blessed, I'm blessed to be a blessing. I don't worship the blessed things, I worship the blessor. And I worship the blessor by bringing the blessings, where? To the house. So you can't sit there and say, oh man, God has really blessed me. You can't say that when you're robbing God of your abilities and gifts, when you're robbing God of the resources. You, you can't play that game. That's the height of hypocrisy. You're disrespecting God. Well let's, well, let's keep on going. Look at this, Daniel chapter five, verses four and six. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron and wood and stone. Oh, that sounds so barbaric. That sounds so basic, so simple, so shallow. Worshiping gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone. We do the same thing. We struggle with the same thing, don't we? Why are people squawking and squealing about the economy all over the world? You know why? Because their God, lowercase g, has failed them. Their God, lowercase g, has not come through in the clutch during crunch time. So they're worshiping, and this is just a, a crazy party, and, and everything's going on. Belshazzar had the best seat in the house as he was watching everything take place and suddenly something really weird happened. A hand that came out of the wall. I'm sure Belshazzar was like looking at his, at his uh, goblet like, what am I drinking? And, 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 and this hand wrote three basic words in Aramaic. Three words. And <laughs> check out what he did, verse six. His face turned pale. He was frightened that his knees knocked together. His legs gave away. He was like, oh man, the writing is on the wall. <laughs> and, 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 and that's pretty much this message in a nutshell. The writing is on the wall. Hey, Belshazzar's in the house. The writing is on the wall. Hey, self-worshippers, the writing is on the wall. Hey, people who disrespect God, the writing is on the wall. So Belshazzar, check this out, disrespected God, and he also disregarded the guidance and the history of God. Okay, stay with me now. Nebuchadnezzar, who was probably his grandfather. Last time we saw what happened to him. Nebuchadnezzar was into self-worship. He was into the ride of pride. And because of it, Daniel warned him, hey, Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to be in trouble, my brother. And, and, and he had 12 months to repent. He didn't do it. And because of it, he was driven away from his kingdom, spent seven years like an ah, ox or a cow or a ah, donkey, the Bible says, eating grass. He totally lost his mind. He OD'd on crazy pills. Finally, though, he tapped out. He said, God, I can't fight you. I can't wrestle with you, God. This is Nebuchadnezzar, you're God and I'm not. Then what happened? His life was changed. Well, our boy Belshazzar, 
the 30-something-year-old whiz kid. He knew that whole story. He knew that whole scene, but he sort of just disregarded it. He didn't even remember Daniel. I mean, Daniel, what a difference maker. So he disrespected God and he disregarded history in Daniel. Because in Daniel chapter five, verse 13, I don't have time to to, to unpack all of it. Daniel was finally brought in to interpret the meaning of these three basic Aramaic words. This, This guy understood and spoke Aramaic, but he couldn't read the writing on the wall. No one else could read it. The crazy people around him couldn't read it because they were crazy. Daniel had discernment. He had wisdom. He was brought in, and check out what he said. Daniel was brought in before the king, and the king said to him, Are you Daniel, one of the exiles my father, the king, brought from Judah? Well, Daniel's going to tell us right here the first thing we need to do when we're confronting the crazy people in our lives. Are you thinking about the crazy people, crazy family members, crazy teachers, coaches, bosses, Crazy friends, crazy neighbors, okay? The first thing, here we go, live a life of integrity. Because when you live a life of integrity, the word integrity comes from the word integer, whole number, wholeness. When we live a life of wholeness, God will give us an opportunity to confront the crazies in our lives. Did you hear that? Live a life that reflects the nature and the character of God. And in God's timing, you'll have an opportunity to talk to the person, and that's what Daniel did. And and, and you gotta know that Daniel's Krazar went off when he walked in to Belshazzar's Oval Office. All of us have a Krazar. A a, a Krazar is given to us by the Holy Spirit of God. It's a device, and this this device is numbered one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right. Uh, six to 10, man, you are crazy, crazy. One to four, eh, not that crazy. You know, all of us are probably one to a four, but a five, you're, 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 you're kind of a tweener. But a Krazar is what the Holy Spirit puts in our lives. When we see someone, if it goes, if it's like a, a seven or a nine or a 10, whoa, stop in the name of love and check them out. In fact, you better check out your decisions and your thoughts and your, and your Krazar readings with a Daniel in your life. And I gotta ask you a question. Do you have a Daniel in your life? If you don't have a Daniel in your life, you're just gonna seek counsel from crazy people and they'll give you crazy advice. You gotta find the Daniels and say, hey, hey Daniel, uh, is this person crazy? I mean, Daniel, let me run this by you. I mean, this sounds kind of weird. Is it crazy? And when you ask a Daniel, nine times out of 10, the Daniel will go, yes, it's crazy. Yes, yes. But a lot of us don't have any Daniels in our lives. Pray for a Daniel. So integrity will give you an opportunity to talk into someone's life. Notice something else that'll happen. When you Make God, God in your life. When you say, God, you're sovereign, here's what is gonna happen. You are gonna live a life of honor. You will honor the person's position, check this out now, without having to applaud their behavior. We have lost that, friends, along the way. We've gotta honor the position. Here's what Daniel said to this amoral king, Belshazzar. Daniel, O king. He's like, you know what? You're the man. The most high God gave your father, really grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar's sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. He was like, Belshazzar, everything you have is from God. Now, did, did, did Daniel like what Belshazzar was doing? No. Did he honor the position? Yes. I think it has been pitiful what our nation has done to President George 
Bush. The media needs to get on their face and repent before God. I don't care what you think about George Bush. I'm not here to say, yay George Bush or nay George Bush. No, no, no. I'm saying as believers, we better honor the president of the United States, just like we better honor President Obama as he is inaugurated in just a couple of days. But I'm telling you, man, what is wrong with us? Where have we missed it? Hey, students, honor your mom because she's your mom. Honor your dad because he's your dad. Well, you don't know my mom. I don't care. You don't, I, I don't care. I, I don't. Honor your boss. Honor your manager. Honor people. And guess what happens? God will honor you. You don't have to like them. You don't have to applaud their character. You think Daniel was going, oh, great, Belshazzar. Marry another wife, another concubine. Awesome. Have another, you know, topless party for everyone to see. That's what was going on here. Yeah, get drunk some more. Yeah. He wasn't doing that. But he honored him. But he honored him. So disrespect. He disregarded Daniel and, and learning from history. Okay, what else do we have? Oh, verse 20. Daniel's going to tell us something else to do. You know, because we all have to confront crazies, right? Speak the truth in love. I live a life of integrity. I honor the position. Then I speak the truth in love. And this is where so many people just kind of collapse. Well, I, I, I don't know if I can really tell them the truth. Don't yell. Don't, ah, don't explode. Speak the truth in love. God will give you the opportunity. He will serve the Belshazzars in your life up to you, and he's going to give you the leadership opportunity to speak the truth in love to them. We've got to be ready. We've got to be ready. What if Jesus hadn't have told the truth to you and me? I mean, I was thinking about that in my own life. What if Jesus just didn't tell the truth to me, the whole truth? What if he just said, you know, Ed, you are a pretty good guy. I mean, you know, you're, you're a preacher and all that. You know, you're, you're good, and the good outweighs the bad, and, you well, know, everything's fine. Well, when I die, I would look at the Lord, and I'd be like, why am I in hell? You didn't tell me I had to accept you. You didn't tell me I had to repent for my sins and bow the knee and say that you're sovereign and live. You didn't tell me. Well, I didn't want to hurt your feelings. Jesus wouldn't say that. He loves you and he loves me enough to say, here's the deal. So you got to love the person enough because remember, Jesus died for them too to speak the truth in love. Don't cower. Don't yell. Don't, don't freak out. But speak to them. And here's what Daniel did. He gave, he gave Belshazzar a little history lesson. He said, remember Nebuchadnezzar? You remember when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride? Pride will make you crazy. I mean, pride will make you crazy. Pride goes before every sin. Did you know that? It's the forerunner of all sins. I, I, I wrote a book, the first book I ever wrote years ago, called Fatal Distractions. And the first thing I talked about was pride, the right of pride. Because whenever I sin, pride is first. The think about greed. Think about greed, you know, the reed is greed. I'm not just greedy. First of all, I'm prideful. God, I'm sovereign. And I deserve that. I want that for me. Pride and greed. Lust. God, I don't, I don't want to do sex the way you have, have told me to do it. I'm going to be sovereign and I'm going to do it the way I want. It's not lust, it's pride then lust. So every sin is the ride of pride. I'm God and you're not. That's what we tell the Lord. So he's like, Belshazzar, when Nebuchadnezzar's heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. Wow. He just told him the truth. So we tell the truth. 
Because you could be that person that God is going to use to change this person's life. I'm not going to lie to you, though. I've had the opportunity to talk to a number of people in my life who have been on the ride of pride, a number of people who have done the Belshazzar thing, a number of people who have lived in crazy acres. And you know what? About 60 to 70% of them never change. This is what they don't tell you (laughs) before you become a believer. I'm just going to tell you right now. 60 to 70% are so blinded by pride, they're so hardened by pride, they're so callous by pride, they're not going to change. Now, we, we sometimes think the most prideful people are the Terrell Owens types. No, 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 no. Sometimes the most prideful people that we ever deal with are the meek ones, the mild ones, the most conservative ones. Pride will mess you up, man. You're on the ride of pride, you're going to go crazy. You'll disrespect God. You'll disregard advice and stay away from the Daniels. You're not going to learn from history. And here's the third thing. You will deconstruct. That's what happened to Belshazzar. He was 3D dumb. 3D dumb. But let's go back to this whole confrontation thing. Speak the truth and shame the devil. Speak the truth in love and shame the devil. And here's the fourth thing we can learn. We live a life of integrity, number one. We honor the position, number two. We speak the truth in love, shame the devil, number three. And number four, I love this, it's their responsibility. Once you share it, it's on them. It's not your responsibility. You do what you have got to do. Just recently, I had to do this with someone and this person turned and I've never seen them again. I talked in a calm voice. God served them up on a platter. I told this young man the truth. He spun on his heels and is gone. And I'm telling you, it's just a matter of time before he hooks up with destruction. Look at verse 22, Daniel chapter five. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all of this. Why was God so swift to judge Belshazzar? (laughs) Because he had the 411. History was right there in front of him. He'd seen the whole deal, man. That's why God was so swift. God gave Nebuchadnezzar, what, 12 months? He didn't do it. He's given Belshazzar about 12 hours because that night, Belshazzar lost it all. But look at verse 23. You remember when I said this to you earlier? He said, you've not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you've set yourself up against the Lord Then that night, verse 30 says, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain. That night he was taken out. That night he clocked out. And Darius the Mede took over the kingdom. The writing was on the wall. And Daniel explained to him what the writing meant. You know what he told him it meant? This is... Many is numbered. Tickle, Wade. Parson, divided. Daniel was like, Belshazzar, your days are numbered. You got 12 hours left. You've been weighed and you've been found lacking tonight. Your soul will be required of you. Hey, Belshazzar, the writing is on the wall. Hey, Belshazzar, the writing is on the wall. Your days are numbered. The only time you're assured of is right now. 
When should you say and live out the fact that God is sovereign and you're not? When should you receive Christ? Now. That's the only time we're guaranteed of. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. You've been weighed and you've come up short. God doesn't grade on on some scale. Okay, Ed, you had more good than bad coming into heaven because the bottom line is I'm a sinner. If you've lived a perfect life, you can get into heaven because you're perfect. But the Bible says there's only been one who's been perfect, that's Jesus. So one sin leads to eternal separation from God. God's holy, he can't wink at sin. Jesus took sin, your sin and mine, on himself as he died on the cross and rose again. If you're counting on performing your way in or good working your way in or uh, religioning your way in, it's not gonna happen for you. It's only the grace of God because Jesus took the weight of your sin. He has balanced the scales by his grace and love. Have you received that? Because who knows, you might have 12 months like Nebuchadnezzar or 12 hours like Belshazzar. And after it's said and done, everything's gonna be divided anyway. What's so humorous about life is we think we own stuff. That is, it is so hilarious. We, we think we own stuff. Talking about swallowing a crazy pill, Whatever you have, I don't care what you have, you only have it for, I don't know, 25 years. That's when you're healthy and you can spend some of it and do some of it. After that, you die, it's divided, and then it's divided again after they die and divided again. You don't own anything. I've done a lot of funerals. I've never seen anybody take it with them. I've never seen it. Why don't you make this decision, Belshazzar, to follow the Lord? Why don't you make this decision to get off the throne of your life and to put Jesus there? Why don't you make this decision to say, Jesus, you're sovereign and I'm not. Why don't you make this decision, ladies and gentlemen, to learn from history? Why don't you make this decision to apply the principles of confronting the crazies in your life so you can spend the most time with the normal? Why don't you do that? Let's learn from history and live out his story, okay? Let's pray together. God, I'm gonna pray a prayer right now, and this is not my prayer. This is a prayer that I prayed years ago, but this is the prayer that I believe many need to pray right here. Many who are at our different campuses, many who are watching this by television, many who will download this, many who will see this online, many of you, need to pray this prayer. Just say, God, you know what? I've, I've tried to run my life my way. I've tried to be sovereign. I've tried to do the Belshazzar thing. And right now, I, I fire myself. I turn from my sin and turn to you. And Lord, you're sovereign. You rule over my life. I just say this, I admit the sin to you. Turn from that and ask you, Jesus Christ, to come into my life. I give you everything I am right now. Just say that. And everything I'll ever be. You know what? I cannot make you pray that prayer. It's your responsibility. I can't make you do it. But I believe that many of you prayed that prayer with me. And if you did, I wanna know who I included in that prayer. If you prayed that prayer with me, would you slip your hand up? No one looking or moving. Yeah, yeah, many, many hands. Many hands are going up here. On, on, on the floor, in the balcony. Man, let me tell you something. That is the greatest thing that you'll ever do. The best thing that you'll ever do. And let me challenge you after this service to just make a beeline to the kiosk area in our lobby and just walk up to somebody and just say, hey, I prayed with Ed because we wanna give you just some, some information on your new life in Christ. It's critical. It's just like when, it, when a child is born, those first few hours are critical. It's critical that you do that. 
Because Fellowship Church is a place where you can grow and discover what it means to walk with the Lord. Man, that was awesome. Others of us here, man, we're trying to process life. And as we just look at our life, we see that we've been wasting too much time with the crazy people. And maybe, just maybe, it's time for us to do some confronting, to, to begin to speak and to live a life of difference. Maybe it's time for us to, to go and, and seek out those Daniels and run decisions and, and relationships by them. God, you know the heart, you know the situation. And we just thank you for this time. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.